Hello, everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers, Karen Zuka and Jamie Jamison, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speakers, Karen Zuka has been a paper conservator in private practice for 40 years. Her work encompasses a full range of work on paper from the 15th century up to contemporary pieces. She has been responsible for many collections, including fine art, archival material, maps, historic currency, and rare books, both in private hands and institutions. The studio she, was, she has is involved in both conservation and preservation treatments. She and her staff not only repair damaged items, but provide information in extending the life of an object and has also trained both pre and post program conservation interns for over 30 years and <clears throat> lectured widely to the general public. The studio is the Zucker, uh, Zucker Art Conservation uh, Center in Oakland, California. Uh, the speaker for today is Jamia Jamison, who is the owner of Jamison Art Conservation, a paper conservation studio in Cleveland, Ohio. She received an MLIS with a concentration in book and paper conservation from the University of Texas at Austin in 2003. During her conservation career, she has worked at ICA Art Conservation in Cleveland, Zuka Art Conservation in Oakland, and the Newberry Library in Chicago. She regularly lectures and teaches classes for museums, libraries, colleges, and artists on topics such as conservation matching and framing, basic book repair, caring and handling of works of paper, working with contemporary artists, conservation material for artists, and collecting fine art from a conservator's perspective. She's a member of the American Institute of Conservation since 2000 and a fellow since 2019. She was the book and paper group program chair for the 2012 AIC annual meeting after filling the role of assistant program chair in 2011. She has presented at professional conferences such as AIC, the Midwest Conservation Guild, and the Association of Midwest Museums. Articles from these talks have also appeared in the Book and Paper Group Annual and the Topics in Photographic Preservation. The topic for today's talk is East Meets West, the influence of East Asian techniques in Western paper conservation. Over the past 40 years, Western conservators have adopted many materials and working methods from the art of East Asian screen and scroll mounting. The reversible adhesive, strong bitting papers, and methods of lining using large sheets of handmade papers have revolutionized the way works of on art are treated. Karen Zuper and Jamie Jameson today, these two private paper conservators from the United States, We'll review some of these materials and methods and share insights about how ancient ways of working have become standard practices in modern paper conservation. We will start with Karen first. She'll be the she'll start the talk and then later on Jamia will be joining us. So before I request Karen to start her presentation, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please do type in your name, organization name, and email ID in the chat box, and also type in your questions there. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. So thank you, Jamie and Karen. Over to you, Karen, now. Thank you, Padma, and good afternoon, or should I say good morning for me. Uh, I'm very glad to have Jamie and I give this brief introduction to the use of Japanese papers and how they are employed in Western art conservation. Paper has been made in Japan for over a thousand years. Even though it was originally invented in China, the use of the material quickly spread to, to uh, Japan where it was initially used for utilitarian purposes. Uh, as a writing and a uh, drawing surface uh, for printing for books. And I'm trying to, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, Japanese papers were initially used for a, a multitude of everyday applications because they have particular qualities that allow them to do so. 
here are some calligraphy books, some blank notebooks that were originally used, but very soon Japanese papers came to be used for things such as not just printing, but packaging, clothing, uh, stencil printing for fabrics. These are all types of Japanese paper. Some of them are coated to make them a little bit more uh, durable, but it was very clear that even early on and today, Japanese paper remains the preferred material for a very large variety of items, including, of course, screens and scrolls. Uh, the lightweight nature of paper allows it to be used for screen partitions in homes, for example. And of course, scroll manufacture painting on paper has been around for a very long time. Scrolls used for both decorative and religious purposes. Here are a few more contemporary uh, examples of packaging. And in, in Japan, of course, there is a very large uh, selection of decorative items that rely on paper as the material. But in a more modern way, paper has been used for art, for lighting, and in architecture. Uh, one of the great qualities of Japanese paper is that it is thin and translucent. It's able to transmit light. So here, for example, are walls that are covered with Japanese paper, illuminated from behind, and are portable. They can be moved around because of their lightweight nature. So what makes Japanese paper so versatile? Uh, how do they differ from Western papers? So by Western papers, I'm referring primarily to European and American papers. They have uh, traditionally been made from cotton, linen, and hemp plants, which are cellulose. Papers in Japan are also made from plants, but different plants. And the three primary plants used in Japanese paper making are kozo, which is also known as Japanese mulberry, mitsumata, and gompi. These are all plant fibers. They're all woody plants, and they all have individual characteristics. Uh, mitsumata, for example, produces a fiber that is uh, soft, warm in color. Gompi, uh, a much more difficult plant to work with, it grows wild in Japan. It's not easily uh, cultivated, but it does produce a paper that is uh, glossy and silky in its uh, finish, a very beautiful paper. It's kozo that is the used most often. Kozo accounts for about 90% of all the plant fiber produced in Japan for hand paper making. And this is what the plant looks like before the bark is removed. And inside those long stalks is a white, long fiber that really determines the nature of the paper. Um, these fibers, which you can see in the upper left, this is after the bark has been removed. The fibers have been washed. They're very long, they haven't been chopped up yet to go into a vat to actually help form a sheet. So the way Japanese papers are made is similar to those of Western, but they're done on a slightly different mold. And you can see here, a paper sheet is being formed on a two-part mold that is dipped into a vat of fibers that are dispersed in a great deal of water. And that mold is dipped into the vat to help uh, repeated, repeatedly dipped into a vat to get an even dispersion of fibers on the surface, almost like a felted material. The water is then drained out of the mold and that wet felt of fibers is then pressed 
and dried. Um, the Japanese paper, which is referred as washi, washi simply means Japanese paper, wa Japan, she paper. It can be made in various thicknesses and sizes, but its strength comes not from the thickness of the sheet, but from the length of the fibers and how they intertwine and overlap one another. So these fibers, which are traditionally made by hand and are now made by machine and by hand, are the ones that conservators are most interested in. You can see from just this quick array of Japanese papers that they are lightweight, they're pliant, again, absorbent and translucent. So they very easily can form, meaning they, they shape to a surface. They don't contain any modifiers or fillers that would be used to make a paper sheet stiffer or thicker. What they rely on is the beauty of those long fibers, the ability to be absorbed, to be pliant, and they are relatively free from impurities as well. Uh, they're very long lasting and they are used in Western conservation. I just wanted to show a project that we just about two weeks ago to show how these Japanese papers are used uh, when we're working Western art. What you have in this slide is uh, a series of engravings that when put all together are about three and a half meters long. Uh, it is a map of Hadrian's Villa done late 18th century. And the engravings were produced on six individual sheets of heavyweight Italian paper. They were then joined with an overlapping margin. But when this large print came into our studio, it was folded up to a very small size. It was dirty, it was discolored, and we had to do a fair amount of concert on it before we put it back together in this current form. After cleaning, wet and dry cleaning and washing, we rejoined the overlaps of the six sections. And then to provide overall support and consolidation, we large sheets of COZO paper applied with paste onto the back of the engravings once they were assembled. This COZO backing allows the print to remain flexible. It doesn't stiffen it in a way that makes it no longer seem like a sheet of paper, but it does provide support overall to tears, to cracks along the intersections, and it uh, blends quite beautifully. So I thought I would show uh, an 18th century example of the application of these papers, which is kind of a perfect segue to Jamie. So please go ahead, Jamie. Okay, here we go. Uh, can you all hear me well? Okay, I'm trying to start from the beginning. Yes. There we go. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Karen. Um, I would like to start actually with a land acknowledgement which is becoming a lot more common in the US uh, to recognize the rich history of native people in this country who are often forcibly removed from their ancient lands. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Cleveland, Ohio resides on the traditional lands of the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, 
and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I encourage everyone to learn more about the Native people in their own communities um, who have continued to steward these lands throughout generations. Thank you. So I will now discuss a lining treatment for an oversized Western object as an example for how we have uh, incorporated traditional Asian techniques into our standard conservation practice. Um, a huge thank you to my colleague at the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, Ika Shao. Uh, she's the conservator of Asian paintings and she provided me with a number of images uh, of various methods that she uses in her studio for comparison. Uh, Western posters were often printed on thinner, poor quality papers, many of which have become torn and brittle with age. Uh, most of these posters were never meant to last longer than whatever it was they were advertising. Uh, and further, rather than using linen, um, which was and, and still is um, a common lining technique for larger Western papers, um, many conservators now use Asian papers adhered with wheat starch paste uh, as an alternative. Um, as Karen noted, even though they are thin, Asian papers are incredibly strong uh, due to the uh, length of the fibers and the techniques that are used to form the sheets. Um, linen linings are often way too heavy uh, for the posters and they often leave an impression in the, uh, of the weave that you can see from the front of the sheet. Uh, so if a lining needs to be deconstructed in the future, um, the thinner Asian papers and the water-soluble wheat starch paste is much easier to reverse than a heavier weight linen uh, lining and, and any myriad of adhesives that might have been used to attach those linings. So first, a little background uh, on the object that we'll be discussing. Uh, the London transport poster is an oversized chromolithograph uh, from 1927. Uh, it was issued as a promotional poster for the London Underground, and it depicts various forms of transportation over 16 centuries. Uh, true to form, the paper is poor quality, thinner machine-made paper, uh, which has become discolored and brittle over time. The sheet experienced some water damage on one edge, um, and also had various sharp creases that were very weak. Uh, there was a lot of dirt and dust, as you can see. There were several punctures in the paper, uh, but surprisingly few losses, actually, only mostly around the edges. Uh, but in short, it, it led a pretty hard life. Uh, following a thorough surface cleaning with cosmetic sponges, the poster was washed in several alkaline water baths to reduce the discoloration and the acidity in the sheet. You can see the dark yellow water in the corner of that tray as evidence for just how discolored this sheet was. Uh, and since this was a stabilization treatment, we did not do any bleaching or any restorative steps uh, to further reduce the discoloration. Following washing, uh, we lifted the piece out of the bath on a support of spun polyester web called Hollytex. Uh, the object was laid face down on an oversized piece of polyester sheet that we had adhered to the table by spraying the table with water and then flattening the polyester with a dry towel to remove any air bubbles. With the back of the object and hence the support now uh, up on the table, we were able to brush through the Holytex with a smoothing brush and flatten the object face down onto the polyester support. Uh, the Holytex layer was removed by rolling it off of the back of the object. So at this point, uh, we could realign any tears as needed and we blotted the back of the object to reduce the moisture in the sheet and also to get a little bit more discoloration out uh, in preparation for lining. So while the basic methods are the same, uh, Western conservators have adapted lining techniques from Asian paintings conservation using non-traditional techniques and materials uh, to assist with the process. 
so here you can see Ika um, working on a red table, which is rarely seen in Western conservation studios. Uh, the red table allows for better, uh, to better see the distribution of paste and the various layers of paper uh, with which they're working. So she lifts that top edge of the pasted paper with a thin wooden plank or uh, in, the, in the image on the right, a more modern adaptation of a plexiglass uh, bar. Uh, and the sheet is laid down on the back of the object and brushed to remove bubbles and ensure full adhesion. For the lining of our London Underground poster, we used a traditional Japanese pasting brush called a noribaki uh, to paste out our Japanese paper. And we used a man-made or a machine-made uh, sekishu paper from a roll. Um, and we used that with a highly purified wheat starch paste called Jin Shofu. We used another sheet of polyester adhered to the table with the water spray technique as our support for our lining paper. The raking light from the windows allowed us to see whether we had an even layer of paste on the lining paper. So in lieu of the wooden bar method, um, the pasted lining paper was then lifted using the polyester support and aligned with the object, leaving an overhanging edge all the way around. The lining paper was brushed down uh, to the back of the object through the polyester support uh, because Western papers are far less fibrous than Asian papers, uh, we adhered the rougher side of the lining paper to the object for maximum adhesion. And the polyester support allowed us to use a good deal of pressure with the brush uh, to ensure that we had full contact uh, with the back of the sheet without damaging the, the Jap Japanese paper. Utilizing the same rolling technique we used to remove the Holytex's support, or the, the object's Holytex support, we removed the lining paper's polyester support. Uh, and the same process can be repeated if additional pieces of lining paper are needed to cover the back of the object. Uh, each section of lining paper is overlapped with a water-torn edge to its adjacent piece. We used small strips of lining paper adhered with wheat starch paste to bridge the two pieces of the lining paper at the extreme edge to prevent possible separation during drying. Uh, finally, with the polyester removed, a large flat tamping brush known as an uchibaki was used to ensure that the lining paper was well adhered overall. The traditional method of drying objects in Asian paintings conservation is a karibari. Uh, it's constructed over a wood lattice structure. Multiple layers of various weights of paper are stretched over the wood to create a tensioned paper surface. Uh, some layers are fully pasted while others are floating. Uh, the karibari is double-sided to ensure equal tension throughout. Once the karibari is complete, uh, lined objects are mounted to the surface face out using the paper around the edges to adhere them to the board. Uh, objects are allowed to stretch dry, uncovered, upright, sometimes for many months. A karibari will be used over and over again uh, with the edges of the previous projects visible as white stripes against the darker paper on the board on the left. The paper on the karibari has a darker tone due to the fermented persimmon juice that is traditionally used to seal the paper and create a moisture resistant surface. For extremely large objects, uh, the upright drying method can be adapted for use on a gallery wall as you see Ika doing on the, on the right. For a fantastic video of making a karibari from start to finish, uh, the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC filmed a 2014 workshop where they constructed a karibari over seven days uh, in the traditional style. It's highly recommended, and I think we'll have some time at the end of my talk to watch this. Uh, it's 11 minutes long, so it's a little bit long to stick in the middle of the talk, but we'll come back to it. Uh, for our project, 
we used a combination of the Asian Karibari stretch drying method, coupled with a Western style pressure drying technique. The piece was flipped over face up on the table with the release layer of Holitex on the back. The Holitex was slightly smaller than the lining paper overall to act as a release layer between the object and the table. The free edges of the lining paper were pasted down to the table with a line of wheat paste as if the table were a karibari. The piece was then covered overall with a large piece of Holitex and wooden wool felt. So heavy boards and weights were placed on top of the piece over the felt and the piece were, was allowed to dry for about 24 hours. Uh, after that time, the felt was replaced with the thick cotton blotters and the object stayed under weight for about two weeks. After the object was removed from the table, the edges of the lining paper were cut, leaving an inch handling margin all the way around uh, with tabs at the top edge to be used as hinges for framing. The lining paper consolidates the damaged edges and serves to support the paper overall. In the raking light photo of the verso, you can see how the stretch drying technique uh, pulled out the severe creases uh, the lighter line towards the top edge of the sheet is the slight overlap of the two pieces of lining paper that we needed to fully cover the back of the sheet. The small bridges that were used to reinforce the join at the extreme edges during drying have now been trimmed off. So techniques for the construction and conservation of Asian paintings are rooted in an ancient tradition used to create screens and scrolls that have endured for generations. The materials and methods used by our Asian colleagues have offered Western conservators a wide variety of options for improving our conservation practice, and we are better for it. Uh, we hope that more international exchanges, such as this program, um, will continue to open doors for conservators all over the world to learn from each other. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today and especially to Karen for getting up really, really early on the West Coast to participate in this, uh, in this discussion. Thank you. Karen, uh, Jamia, will, we, will we be playing the video then? Uh, uh, yeah, we can go back uh, and play that video. Yeah, and then probably we'll do the questions. One can't hear. Jamie, is there a the volume? One can't hear the piece. Can you hear now? No, not over the tone. Uh, so I can sort of narrate. <laughs> um, yeah. Basically what Andrew's discussing is how um, karibaris were used initially as a, um, the mounting of objects to using that lattice structure is really ancient. Um, and there's not really a clear idea of when that uh, technique started to be used for conservation, um, but for the mounting of screens and scrolls, um, this was used all the way back in the 8th, 9th, 10th century. So it's a really ancient technique. Um, and part of the reason that the karibari works so well 
is that its construction really helps with the drying process, um, keeping things under tension and keeping things really nice and flat as they dry. Um, it really balances out all of the different forces that happen between the different materials as they dry. So here, this piece uh, is paper in the image area and then um, different silks on the edges. And this is a very traditional scroll mounting technique. So the first layer is actually pasted directly to the lap work uh, with a really nice lightweight paper. We add a number of different layers and I'll kind of go through all of these layers, uh, but this is the initial one. And with the layers that are adhered to the lattice work, generally they're using a much thicker uh, type of paste. Um, and then when they get to adhering some of the papers overall, they'll be using a much thinner paste. They're just smoothing that down, making sure that it's attached to all of the uh, lattice work there. Here's the second layer. And this is one that is attached overall. So when you see that they are um, pasting out the sheets in full, those sheets are laid down and those are adhered overall to the layer below. And we'll see in subsequent layers where they're only pasting out the edges of the sheet. And those layers are floating layers, what are called floating layers. And as we're watching this, you'll also note that the papers are all different sizes. And that is so that there aren't, um, there aren't overlaps in all of the same places. So they wanna make sure that all of those overlaps with the, with the different layers of paper are, um, are offset from each other so that it keeps the, the uh, tension nice and even and distributes all of those different seams. So here they're creating large rolls of paper uh, by attaching smaller sheets together right at that little edge. And they'll be making long rolls of paper for a floating layer. There's really nice piano music, which I wish you could hear. So. so here they're just facing the edges. And they're gonna be putting this one down only on the lattice work. So the paper in between the lattice work will actually not be adhered. And keep in mind too that this process was done over seven days uh, as they build up all of the different layers of paper. And so this is another layer that's fully pasted out. So it will be fully adhered to the layer below. Uh, unlike the previous layer that, that was floating. And you can see that the paste that they're using is a lot thinner than the paste that they would use uh, when they're just attaching it to the lattice work. And again, this is a different size. So each layer is a slightly different size of paper to distribute all of those. brushing to make sure that there's full adhesion, putting everything nice and flat. And you'll see a little rippling, but as the karibari dries, uh, it will tension very nicely. So 
this is another floating layer. And you can see that they are setting up the sheets to just expose those little edges of the sheet. Uh, and that's what they will be pasting out. And that ensures that they're getting just these little, little bits of paste right on the edge. And you'll also notice that all of these sheets are water torn, which means they have nice fibrous edges. You can see it really well in that, that shot there. They have nice fibrous edges uh, so that they can really adhere well on those edges. So here you can see they're flipping it over because everything that they do to one side, they have to do to the other side. So the Karibari is a two-sided board. And um, so when they do a layer on one side, they flip it over and do the same layer on the other side. And this helps to kind of equally tension everything and make sure that uh, everything is nice and even. This is the last layer, the two body. And again, it's a fully pasted out layer. And these are the largest sheets, other than the rolls, that are used since it's the last layer. And this, you might actually do a couple of these layers. You might do two or three of these layers uh, as the final layer. And here, you might start adding a little bit of the fermented persimmon juice into the paste as you go um, to start building up that persimmon juice layer. Yeah, so again, if you were putting multiple layers of shibari on, you would um, change the placement of those seams so to make sure that they're not all in the same place, that they don't fall in the same place. So here's the fermented persimmon juice that after the karibari is fully dry, it's brushed on the surface of multiple layers, multiple times. And Andrew was talking about the paste, which is uh, what I had already mentioned, that the, the thicker paste is for things that are only uh, on the edges or adhered to the wooden lattice structure. Uh, you want to make sure that that adhesion is really good. And then thinner paste uh, for, the, for the pasted overall layers. So more lovely piano music, <laughs> and uh, thank you to the end of this video. So hopefully that gave you a good idea of how a karibari is, is uh, constructed and kind of why all of the different methods um, that are used have an impact on how that uh, karibari functions over time. Um, again, it's really important to make sure that um, you have really even layers of paper overall, uh, you let it dry so that it tensions and then you add the next layer. Uh, so again, this was done over, um, it was done over seven days, I believe, that it took them to build that card bar. So now we can take uh, any questions, uh, if anything's come in through the chat or uh, people can unmute and ask questions. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Jamia, for a lovely presentation. Uh, everyone, please type in your questions. I don't see any questions, so if you have any questions, do type those in. Um, I just had one question from my side to just begin with. If you could describe the paper that you used for lining the poster, uh, you said, sure. it was, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's actually a machine-made um, roll paper, um, mm -hmm. sakishu. And the reason that we will sometimes use the machine-made Japanese papers 
for lining posters is because the posters are themselves machine-made papers. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use handmade papers, uh, but the, the machine-made roll papers are much bigger. And so we can actually use off the roll pieces that are big enough to cover large sections of, of the paper and we do less uh, seaming. So there are less seams that we have to do um, overlapping seams. And these are papers. Uh, yeah, um, in the U.S., there's kind of a really wonderful supplier, Hiromi Papers, and she is able to source a lot of incredible papers from Japan, um, Korea, and and maybe China. Karen is actually good friends with Hiromi, so <laughs> she can maybe speak to that a little bit more. But yeah, uh, we're using all uh, papers that are mostly sourced from Asia. Can I make a quick comment about the engraving that I showed at the end of my talk? Yeah. Um, we did use a machine made sex shoe uh, because the piece was so big, yeah. even uh, to span that length and width, we used six separate sheets of the sex shoe that we pieced together. As Jamie said, otherwise we would be, it'd be like a patchwork quilt of smaller sheets. Uh, the second issue actually comes even in the machine made version in different weights, uh, a thin, a uh, thick, an extra thick, but even the extra thick, which is what we used on that particular piece is still incredibly lightweight and was considerably thinner than the actual engraving we were attaching it to. Okay, thanks. We, they, we also have a question. Uh, are papers dyed according to the object? And if you do any dyeing, what do you use? What are the techniques that you use? Um, I, I, would, I could start and Jamie can add in. Um, we do dye papers. We do have a number of Japanese papers that come in various shades of white, but often when we need to uh, maybe even use Japanese papers to fill a loss. We do have to dye them and we use acrylic uh, pigments. The reason for that is those papers are almost always going to be applied with a water-based adhesive. And so we can't use watercolors because the watercolor pigment would bleed when we use the adhesive. So we, we're gotten quite good at dyeing even large sheets of paper with very thinned out acrylic uh, pigments. And that works quite well. Yeah, so sometimes what we'll do is we'll do an overall lining of a natural uh, tone sheet. And then if there are fills that are necessary, we might just dye the paper for the fills only, not the full sheet that we use for lining. Um, but also uh, there are some Kozo papers, color Kozo papers that you can buy. That's kind of a new thing um, that Hiromi has uh, that are, um, I believe they're coming out of Korea. I'm not entirely sure, but the, the different colors of Kozo, um, everything from different shades of tan, which are very helpful for what we do often, to blue and green, and uh, which can be really useful in book conservation, for example. Yes, I wanted to also mention that uh, Japanese papers are increasingly used in book conservation, again, for the very reasons that they're so adaptable and formable. Um, you can dye those papers and use them to make repairs without on, on everything from leather and cloth books because the Japanese paper is, again, lightweight, you can build up layers. And also um, it's easily removable if at a later date that repair needs to be taken off and redone for some reason. But we dye a lot of Japanese papers actually for book binding repair as well. Okay, thank you. The next question is overlapping the Karabari board with so many Japanese paper would increase the cost how much is charged for this procedure? I mean, what is the costing? 
for conservation uh, in Nigeria? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually don't know. I've never made a karibari myself. Um, but yeah, I would imagine that by the time you purchase all of those papers, it's getting pretty expensive. Yes. Um, the other thing too is actually making the lattice structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that for the Folger, when they made theirs, I think they had a lattice structure that was like old, that was hanging around that they resurrected. Um, but in terms of the lattice structure, you would either need someone to build that for you or have it built. Um, and that, could be an expense as well. Uh, but all of those papers, yeah, it would, it would be not inexpensive. The paste is really cheap, but the papers are very expensive. Paste is cheap, yes. But again, those those karibaris last for years. So, you know, if even if you're talking about um, having uh, an expense of, you know, 500 or $1,000 to make a karibari, that karibari could last for 20, 30 years. That was the next question. Typically, how long would a karibari board last? I think the answer. Yeah, I, I think it depends too on how well you take care of it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah. And also the next part is, would one have to remove the papers and assemble it again at some point? Or uh, the board would be used the way it has been assembled once it goes on forever? Uh, again, I think it depends on how well you take care of it. Okay. I, I can tell you that many years ago, I took a workshop and we all made karibari boards. Um, we did use it for a few years, but unfortunately it got stored somewhere where uh, the papers um, split partially mm -hmm. from uh, heating. But what you can do is you can remove those papers, you can even strip the board back down to the wood grid and repaper it again. The, the that, that's a possibility because yeah, it yeah. is. Yes. I'm planning on doing that soon. <laughs> yeah. So that's the next question. I think that is all. We don't have any more questions. Are there any other questions? Please do type them in. I don't see any. I think those were the questions. A lot of interest for the Karibari board. Okay, we have one more question. Is the lattice made from Japanese cedar wood or something else? And also, if you could elaborate on the on comment on the smell of fermented persimmon <laughs> juice. I mean, is that an issue? And I'm sure this person has used it at some point. I haven't come across this, but Let's talk about the smell of fermented persimmon and the lattice, the wood lattice that we made. Is it to be made from Japanese cedar or you could make it from any other wood? Is there a would there be a difference on the board that you're making? Karen, since you've made one, I'm gonna Okay. I'm I'm pretty <laughs> sure that the best ones are made from Japanese cedar, although it would be difficult. a sturdy hardwood to make that grid and uh, just has to of course be very much in uh, as for the smell of the produce which is called kakashibu yeah it's um strong but it does dissipate over time it it initially when you apply it it uh, it in a well aerated room but it does dry pretty quickly and the smell disappears. It doesn't stay even when new wet objects are placed on it. I had a question though, it's, as you said, you know, on the board, the pieces are uh, pasted for drying your, or the pieces that you've lined are attached to the board and you do remove them later on. But I, I presume there'll be strips of the line objects left on the board, do we remove them or are they left there? Or maybe I don't um, understand the whole sticking. Yeah, so board. when the, um, and maybe I can go back a little bit to that slide. Um, there you can see the karibari uh, that has all of the different strips mm -hmm. around the edges and, uh, and underneath the piece that's on it. So at some point it might be kind of cleaned off, but for the most part, they just keep using it over and over again. 
So that doesn't affect the, the unevenness, doesn't affect the object that is mounted? It doesn't appear to really. Um, I think the papers, again, are thin enough that um, it's, you know, again, it's used over and over. It's possible that at some point they would they would kind of clean it off and, and it, they might put a little bit more persimmon juice on at some point. Um, but for the most part, they just keep using it as it is. Okay. I think any other question? Please do type them in quickly so that we can or unmute yourself and ask the question. I don't see any in the chat box. No. I think that's it for today. Thank you so much. I think it was a very nice presentation. You're welcome. Clear and something very interesting and new for people to try out. I'm sure we'll be trying out this kind of board preparation. It's just how easily, how easy is it to get the persimmon juice? Is it like something which is easily available or one wants to try it? You would have to get it from a specialty store and we actually bought ours from the same supplier we get our paper from, Hiromi Papers International. And okay. they're located in Los Angeles. And I know for sure they do ship overseas. Okay. So you can get it from them. Okay. I think Although I would imagine in Asia, um, it would be much easier to get yeah. something like this than it is here. So it may be that you would have a local source. Um, I don't know what other purposes fermented for some issues. I don't know what, it's, what else it might be used for, uh, but I, I would imagine that that's something that you could source a little bit more easily yeah. where I you are than where we are. And, yeah, I think paper, paper suppliers in Japan who, yeah. who actually carry conservation grade papers would also carry it for the same reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you very Anna. much for taking out the time You're and welcome. presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this wonderful lecture. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.